Hey. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Beta Zone. Welcome to the Dalian Forum 2019. We are going to talk about surveillance. We're going to talk about a session called No More Obscurity. And of course, we're going to do it while live on the internet. That, I think, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. So uh, today, we, have, uh, we are going to explore what it means for a society uh, to have all these surveillance technologies being deployed. And as you will see, not necessarily by the government itself, but also by private citizens. Why do people do that? What does it change? What are the pluses and the minuses of these technologies being used on a wide, wide scale? We're going to start with a presentation in Chinese. So if you do not speak Chinese, I invite you to raise your hand and get headphones for live translation. Our speaker is going to uh, talk for 15 minutes, and then we will have a panel discussion with two more speakers that are going to join us on stage. And we're going to finish with a Q&A with the audience. So please prepare your questions, raise your hand when we start the panel, and we will give you a microphone. Please wait for the microphone to um, ask your questions so we can have you uh, on the record. Um, and then we can exchange and discuss about this very contemporary and important topic. To open the day, I would like you guys to help me welcome a very famous Chinese artist who's going to show you the movie he made using exclusively surveillance footage that he found on the internet. The first unintentional actors, please help me welcome Mr. Xu Bing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for attending this meeting. And also, thank you very much for inviting me by Davos uh, so that I can introduce my kind of special feature film. And also, thank you for the kind introduction. You know, I'm sorry. You know, in 2013, because I was bored and I watched television program, and this is a pop program or some legal thing. Sorry. It's uh. Oh, yeah, here. Uh, 2013, and uh, 2013, out of boredom, I watched a uh, television program, and it was a program about some legal affairs, etc. And I saw some footage of uh, surveillance cameras, and I was impressed. I feel, I felt that they are charming because, you know, this is some kind of mindless eyes. And the people were watched are very natural because they didn't know that others are were watching them. I, I had the idea that if there is a feature film made of this footage, the film would be very interesting because it will be very different from the traditional feature films because traditional feature films are acted by actors. I mean feature films, not documentary. If I can produ produce such a film, it will be different because every single frame is actually what has happened. Therefore, I started to think this idea. And I asked this idea uh, to my friends who are filmmakers. And all my filmmaker friends said it, it is impossible because, because you even don't have a main character you don't have you, uh, the, the photographers. How do you promote the, slot, the plots? OK, I, will, I said, well, I will show the story of the cosmetic uh, surgery uh, story of that, because anyway, the people will change his face from time to time. And then I started this, uh, the making process. And I find some friends who are uh, guards of a factory or some people from uh, the television station. But my material were, were very limited. This is the first material I got. Uh, this is the parking lot, 
the back door of a parking lot of a hospital. And I got this material and put it into my computer. And I started to invent some, uh, some stories for the people uh, uh, in, in the video and to design some dialogues for them. And after that, it made, made me believe, uh, convinced that with enough materials, I definitely can make a feature film. But you know, at that time, surveillance technology was not uh, well developed. It was impossible for me to get enough materials. But in 2015, I found that there were a lot of materials of the footage uh, on internet. And I started, resumed the program. And I said, I bought 20 uh, computers downloading uh, 24 hours, the, all of these um, videos. And uh, this process last one year. 11,000 hours of vi uh, clips of video. And then I started uh, the, uh, to, to design the script and the dialogues and uh, the editing work also. I think maybe you know there is a film. The name is Truman Show. This story is about a kid from uh, his birth. He was uh, uh, growing up in a, in a very small township. And actually, every moment from his birth to, to, to his adulthood are broadca broadcast. He doesn't know this, but except him, all other people know, know this. And I think my work is, uh, it's the imagina social imagination of the film Truman Show because for me, the world, present world is like a studio. You have lots of surveillance cameras recording every corner of the world about what, happen what is happening and then it sent all of this information to internet. It gives us a spe special perspective or a special eye for us. Why I say so? Because, you know, surveillance cameras or sur surveillance technology enables our eyes or means the organs. The organs of our eye are linear because for today we came here from the hotel to participate in this event, but after this event, I go back to a hotel or go to another place, our information will be different because this, inf this uh, feeling is linear. However, surveillance technology give us a meshy or kind of a net an experience like a, a net or mesh because we can know what is happening around the world. It's kind of like a mesh or net. For example, I am uh, my home and I know what is happening the street next to my my street something special may happen and today we can know that what is happening beside us this was impossible in the past this technology actually has changed our sense of history or value historical values I am thinking for example, any individual or any organization is capable enough to save all the videos of surveillance and leave it for the people of 100 generations later, it will be meaningful. So the people in the future will be more capable to make a judgment about the past or present, or it will be totally different, it would be totally different than otherwise. The, I mean, the people without these recordings. Or, for example, in dynasty of Qing dynasty of China, we don't know what, what was the life of the emperor Guangxu, the second last emperor of China. And if we had that material, we would have a totally different judgment 
than the uh, scholars of present day. Surveillance cameras have this feature, which is in 100 hours, there may be nothing happening, but it's scaring, it's totally silent. And this is the, what his artist would pay attention to. And all of this footage, cameras, you know, a next moment, there might happen something totally out of expectations or something or some um, image. This is our team. We worked several months. Every day we just watched what was happening around the world and our team and has a, had a common feeling that when we went out, we were quite careful because we noticed that the world is uncontrollable. The world is out of expectation. Anything could happen. And because I have a rule for myself in this film, every single frame of this feature film must come from public surveillance frame. It shouldn't be shot by, uh, by us. And this is a rule for my making of this movie. And there is something special brought by this uh, rule. You know, in Buddhism of China, Buddhism doesn't think or body matters at all. Buddhism think spirit or mind or your next life or your reincarnation, reincarnation is the truly is the thing that truly matters. For example, I am here, you are sitting there. Whether are we the real selves? Well, from the perspective of Buddhism, is questionable. Um, so it's actually very questionable uh, no, uh, from the perspective of technology. So there are multiple main characters in this film, and uh, it consists of different civilians' video clips of different people. So that will involve the boundary of uh, truth or the boundary of reality. What is real? For example, uh, every day we are using our cell phones. And when we are looking on our cell phones, it seems that we are playing a show together with our cell phone. For example, we are sending the messages to the world. But are those messages real messages or not? As surveillance technology is improving, in the past several years, we can see that surveillance technology has been improved a lot. So uh, before, UK took the lead, but now Asia takes the lead. And in particular, China um, right now is very advanced in surveillance technology. But what is surveillance? And how do we uh, clearly identify the boundary? And then the US police had the civilians' um, equipment with them when they are on patrolling. We were a little bit concerned and nervous um, at the end of the film shooting because we looked at multiple video clips and we knew that um, how often they change their clothes and how close. Um, are them like between the restaurant servant or restaurant uh, people. So so um, when we look at the video clips, you can find the location at the right up corner and um, you know that where the people are located. 
So that's why we located 90% of the people um, and got the right of uh, displaying their faces on uh, in our film. And as we search for these people, we learned more about civilians, and we learned more about the relationship between people. For example, the first one that we approached, Xiao Wang, or Mr. Wang, um, he said, so this civilian's camera might change his life because maybe he will be an influencer online. For example, he said something great or he did something funny. So he believed that civilian's camera has already changed his life because that's why we approached where we found him. Right now, we have already entered into the post civilians era, and um, most of the civilians cameras in, in China are actually owned by individuals. And uh, we got all the video clips from the individual civilians cameras instead of the government civilians cameras. So it seems that people would like to be connected with the world through their cameras. Of course, for the governments, they manage or control the society by using civilians' cameras. That is another function or another, another use of the civilians' cameras. So apart from the government uh, cameras, I think that the civilians' cameras have more or much wider use because more and more individuals are using them. Now as the technology is developing very fast, and um, the legal system, the virtual system, the morality, and the boundaries between people are changing constantly. And uh, in the end, we can have, um, have a look at a clip from our film. So the voice is not on. The sound is not on. So when I was 17 years old, I was sent to a temple, and I heard that there was some noise. I was lying in bed, and someone was beating me, and I couldn't be. A, I couldn't get awake. So um, these are all the people that we recognize now because we used a lot of um, individual surveillance cameras. So we would like to thank them. Thank you all. The stage a little bit because they're going Here. to add some chairs. Thank you very much. Thank so you. It's. Uh, <coughs> I must say that uh, I was told by the team to prepare. So like, please watch a bit of the movie. And I started to watch it in the airplane, and I was totally glued to it. I think yeah. people behind me thought like I was a very strange person to watch like CCTV <laughs> footage on my computer. <laughs> uh, but I must say that you you, you saw you showed at the end. Uh, actually, the images are quite riveting because. Yeah. I think it's a visual language that now has created the expectation that when you see CCTV uh, footage, it's going to be very boring, like normal life. And from one second, it's going yeah, to right. switch to the opposite. Yeah. And something is going to crumble. Somebody's going to die. And there's a lot of people dying in your movie. I don't uh, know if you've counted, uh, but it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of uh, accidents. I mean, you showed the train accident from Spain. and, and One airplane. Like Maybe one thousand people. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, I thought it was in that sense, very representative of life, that we yeah. seem to have, at the same time, very, very safe and very straightforward lives, and yeah. that they can switch to the extreme uh, in, in yeah. one second. And yeah. 
Um, two other things that really struck me is this idea that you give us, you allow us to peek in the life of others. And in that way, you get us out of our bubbles. You yeah. know, it's being told that social media, for example, puts us into bubbles. I think your work really shows us that, confronts us to the diversity of life and the way uh, other people live. Um, and it's true that if you watch the whole thing, you, you will see that all footage that comes from the different places that are in the credits, it's the coolest movie credits in the world, I think. Um, but at the end, there's this sense, very strange sense, that it's actually the same story, it's the same images, it's the same source. So you, you somehow reconnect us to our humanity. We are going now to debate, and I'm going to call uh, two uh, panelists. Uh, one is the CEO of the Radical Exchange uh, Foundation. She comes from Germany. And the other is the founder and chairman of Octave Consulting Group, is both an attorney and engineer. Please help me welcome to the stage Jennifer Lynn Moron and Neil Hopper. Sue, <laughs> you please yeah. have a seat. Yeah. And I will, I will go behind the stars. Never walk, <laughs> walk in front of the stars. Um, I will start with you, Jennifer. Um, can you, I mean, obviously now we know a little bit more about uh, Shu. Can you tell the audience a little bit about your work at the Radical Exchange Foundation? So we are a non-profit organization, non-governmental organization. And can you hear me OK? It's going to yeah. come up. The, the volume is going to be. Um, and we're looking to use market mechanisms and principles, new ideas, reinstill values to reduce inequality, build cooperative social lives through markets and technology. And one of the ideas is around data. What do we do with data? And around governance as well. Um, and so with the idea of data, there's different ways of looking at uh, the, the origin or like the intersectionality of the data. A lot of the images that we saw you might have one person in there, but then there's lots of other points, so it's not mm -hmm. just one person that it belongs to. And then also we were trying to push the idea of um, MIDs or mediators as individual data as in new institutions mm -hmm. to protect information, give more control to people, and disrupt the, the power and concentration of wealth. So big questions that you, that you tackle from an NGO uh, perspective. Our next, uh, the, the panelist sitting next to you is both an attorney as an engineer, um, and you also deal with the ownership of data, intellectual property, privacy. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Uh, yeah. So um, Octave Consulting is a professional services firm, and we work with both public and private sector institutions, um, just helping them to develop their, their strategic approach to m managing data and managing information risk, so end-to-end -end risk. We help them with regulatory compliance as well as we help them build cyber risk response to protect themselves from um, online attackers. Mm. There are so many, many things I'd like us to discuss today. We only have 20 minutes left. I'd like, if there are people in the audience do, who would like to ask questions, like please raise your hand and wait for the microphone uh, to be brought to you. But some questions that were triggered by uh, looking at uh, your movie. Um, what did we gain as a society from the deployment, uh, the ubiquity of all these technologies? What did we lose? Um, how do you find balance between the individual interest and the social interest? Uh, is this really surveillance? At the end, sometimes you wonder because people put the footage themselves. Uh, what are we going to do when deep fakes happen, when you start to be able to manipulate video? Can a video still be a proof, for example, in a trial? Uh, obfuscation is the new privacy, the art of putting so much content out there that the relevant content uh, cannot uh, be found. Uh, but maybe I'd like to ask the panel this question. Like, if you look in the past 10 years and this massive deployment of cameras in our streets, in our homes, what have we gained and what have we lost, if anything, according to you? Shubing. And actually, everything is a double-edged sword. Everything, you know, the development of any technology has two sides as a coin. It's up to the people, up to our judgment. 
good thing and a bad thing and uh, is rely on our judgment and to avoid any possible risks of making damage of our life today even or we have found 90% of the human being in the world but when we visit when we try to reach out the people to get their rights of their image this is a very traditional way to get their consensus their, their consensus because everybody here you know from your home to here the all way all the information has been collected by big data companies but big data companies never ask your consents whether you agree or not anyway your information and they don't pay you for this data and we want to reach out to the people we sh we, we uh, in our movie and actually this is some logic there maybe the payment method today is totally different than it was in the past and actually the interest you you get is much more than the loss of your privacy rights for example your GPS look lo location on your cell phone is more accurate than otherwise and I think everything is is, is changing is different it's an incredible moment in the movie where you actually show up to this guy you, you show the image and you've been using him in the movie but he's unaware of and he looks at you like, what are you talking about? And then immediately, as you said, he's like, oh, maybe I'm going to be famous. So, okay, I'm going to sign. It was pretty, pretty exciting for him. Uh, but uh, tell us a, a positive. You know, this is probably happening for a reason. Um, what, do you, what do you think we've gained as a society from the pervasiveness of, of images? Three. Uh, for example, for our studio, the benefit for us is I like this way of working with contemporary civilization. We don't have photographers, but every frame, every uh, ca serving camera are cameramen for us, and they work 24 hours for us. This sounds like a, a, a Uber. And uh, this company doesn't have any car, but all the car, all the taxis around the city works for them. This is a today working method, but surveillance technology enabled uh, my feature film. And uh, in other verticals, I think they also got or have gotten benefits which were impossible in the past to go to the world it's the world coming to you and you get free content that you can work with jennifer i, I see your you really want to react on this uh, question <laughs> of the pluses and minuses of these technologies being deployed all around us well i, I do have one question about the the money i guess um so if you make a lot of income from this film or this work would you then also <laughs> share that with the, the actors uh, sure. now, actually, uh, by making this work, we spent a lot of money without making a lot of money. And uh, the, we, we make much less money than we spent because we don't have cameramen, we don't have uh, stars, but we need to spend a lot of money on equipment and uh, human resources and uh, to download so many, uh, so, so much material. But of course, we want to, to show this movie in cinema, but actually we didn't get the license or to show our movie. I also wanted to say something about the, the end scenes as well. You mentioned a lot that they were very impactful, and I think um, that does something compared to watching an action movie where you, you might feel impressed by the graphics or mm. think that, oh, I would hate, you know, it's dystopia, but it's actually happening in front of you. And I think that that has a, a positive, although mm. it's a negative okay. feeling, it has a positive um, 
implication, maybe, in our, our compassion towards each other, our empathy, mm -hmm. um, that that brings with the surveillance and that, but yeah. turning it into a story also. But Jennifer and Neil, we, we know now, I mean, it's been 25 years into this digital technologies revolution, the so-called new technologies which are starting to get old a little bit, but uh, we know that it, it's always about balance. It's always, every technology brings us pluses and minuses, right? The internet brought us Wikipedia and it brought us uh, fake news and online harassment. Um, let's talk about the pluses and minuses uh, of this technology. And, you know, according to both of your perspective, so Neil, you have a more like technical, a more yeah, legal sure. perspective. And Jennifer, you have a more holistic, uh, more grounded into like social issues. Um, can you share with us your view on what has changed in the past 10 years? One start, Neil. Yeah, sure. So, um, across different, like, v v v across different contexts, like we've seen online technology being used for public safety or for public uh, good. For, for example, in the, in the developmental context, we're seeing where large international financing companies, they, prov they provide funding to build uh, infrastructure in certain countries. And many times this funded is, mis is misused or misappropriated. Uh, and we've seen where online surveillance is being used to do time lapse videos to see how the infrastructure is being built and then to see how building that infrastructure actually impacts people's uh, life. So seeing how, how fundamental shift in terms of social and human development is achieved by using uh, online tech. And then there are other public safety like in terms of in the United States for, for truck drivers who drive very long distances. Um, they're incentivized to drive along the distances, but many of them, they fall asleep and have massive accidents. So we're seeing where online surveillance is being used to ensure that they're getting enough rest, they're employing the defensive uh, driving te te techniques, and that their safety while they're on the job is being preserved. So that's one good way or one good use uh, case. Jennifer, according to you, I mean, this balance I was talking about, where, 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 where would you put the cursor? Like, when is too much, too much? Well, it's, it's a question of, is it doing anything, or is it just recording, is it just capturing, and is it just teaching machines, or something for the future that we're not really, there might be some kind of understanding, or you see when something happens, like you said, it's, it's, it's a lot of nothing until there's something. Um, but what, what is the fundamental reason for the capturing? And I mean, there's, there's the example of the drivers of the cars. Their data is being captured, how they drive, what they see for, to train their replacements. Um, and so there's, there's two sides of it. There's the surveillance for surveillance sake, I guess, or mm -hmm. for understanding what's happening all the time. And then there's the, the method of teaching and understanding what we do in those situations that's feeding a, a bigger model mm -hmm. of the world or of artificial intelligence. And I think that who controls that artificial intelligence or that future is what makes it more dystopic or utopic. Yeah, what happens on that? We're gonna go to your question. Sir, just wait for the microphone, please. Please stand up. Very OK. Well, so um, my name is Joanna Bryson, University of Bath. Uh, I'm asking a question from the perspective of the United Kingdom, a very surveilled country. Um, in fact, there has been a big shift in how you get welfare payments in the UK that has disadvantaged a lot of people. If they make a very small mistake, they could lose their welfare for a month, two months. And the question is, why, why has this been accepted? In fact, the UN has just done a big release. There's incredible poverty in the UK right now. And one of the suggestions by Guy Standing is it's because the last time we had riots in 2014, 
there were people who were arrested on the basis of just stealing like one package of, of, of diapers or tampons or something like this. And so now the poor are aware that they're surveilled. So the rich know we're surveilled, but it doesn't affect us very much. But the poor are aware that they're surveilled and they're afraid to say anything because they would lose their state, their state uh, welfare payments. So I, I haven't heard a sufficiently dystopian answer from the panel, so I wanted to bring up this as just one example that there may be different impacts on different people. Mm. Neil, maybe you want to say something as, a, yeah, as an attorney? Uh, <laughs> well, I want to also um, add to that. Like, we're seeing where the m merging of, like, online surveillance and uh, artificial intelligence is actually having negative um, um, results in terms of, for example, they've now put speakers in schools in the United States to, the speakers are supposed to use artificial intelligence to, to detect aggression. And if they detect aggression, it's, it's, it's supposed to prevent like uh, sh sh shooters. But we're seeing where the technology is not much Sure, so you're seeing a lot of false um, um, positive, and you're seeing a lot of wasted time of the security services. But to her point is, as uh, well, you're seeing a lot of negative consequences in poor, in poor areas, not just from the welfare, but also seeing where there's surveillance in the neighborhoods that are meant to, if you hear gunshots, you're supposed to make a phone call to the to the, se, se, the security services, but you're seeing where you're only putting these technologies in certain kind of privileged neighborhoods, and it's net, negatively impacting those people because they're being mm -hmm. over on, on police, and it's breaking down that relationship between the communities and the, the security. But there's a very large trend here. Um, that uh, in, a, in, a, in a twist of history, like having access to technology used to be a sign of wealth for a very long time. You know, 10 years ago, you had a smartphone, you were a wealthy person. And now it's shifting to being a sign of the opposite of wealth. And um, expensive schools now have human teachers, while poor schools have iPads. Um, uh, when you're very high ranked in a company, you can afford not to answer your emails. We, you cannot do if you're uh, low, in a lower rank. So uh, now it seems that luxury is actually being away from technology and being wealthy means increasingly being able to push aside technology, which is, uh, I find, very ironic when you look at, at uh, history. But um, uh, speaking of, uh, uh, you know, the value of these images, there's something very disturbing happening. And actually there is a demo uh, where you can get your, your face scanned, you can choose a famous actor, and that person is going to be saying whatever you said. And it's called the deep fakes. Um, I don't know if you've seen, there's a famous video from Barack Obama. Um, question to the panel, how long can images from surveillance camera actually still be evidence in court when the software to manipulate these images is probably going to be free in one or two years? So, um Interestingly enough, uh, artificial intelligence is being uh, used to create uh, deep fakes, but artificial intelligence is also being used to de detect deep fakes. So the technology actually has a beneficial use as well as a negative uh, use. Um, I want to circle back to, to the point that the, that the um, audience member made as well. Um, there, in terms of using online surveillance to, um, to, to, to profile or negatively impact people, there needs to be a legal framework put in place. And we're seeing some of that in, uh, uh, in GDPR. We're seeing some of that in GDPR where you're not supposed to use online data to negatively profile or negatively impact some person. And that within means, the boundaries of the European Union, Union. that's always the problem it, with yeah, the internet, is yeah, that but it which needs, law applies? But it needs to be, those laws need to be harmonized uh, around the world and to ensure that there's protection, legal protection, so that um, data is not used to profile and disadvantage. Mm -hmm. I saw that when GDPR came online, there was 1,000 websites from the USA 
that basically denied access to European citizens. So this is the way they dealt with it. Like, sorry, you cannot access our website. Um, uh, we have time for one last question. Um, I, I'll get to ask uh, uh, something that is, uh, I find uh, very important. There is this idea that is currently being floated in California for data tax, right? And the model is the tax that was installed by Alaska when there was a pipeline crossing the country. And the state was, was getting money from the pipeline and would give all that money back to the citizen. And so the governor of California is floating the idea of doing the same with data. What do you think about that, Jennifer? You mentioned, you asked a question about the ownership, whether uh, Xu would be giving the money back. What do you think about the idea of a data tax? Would that solve that issue of data ownership? And who makes money from what is being created by the consumers? I don't think it's a solitary solution. I don't think it's just a tax, but also um, creating, like I said, these institutions, these cooperatives that we would uh, put our data to, and then we could say which data we say is allowed to be used. And then there's some data, maybe like energy consumption or something, or, or that goes through Nest. There might be an intermediate um, variation of solutions and one of them might be a tax. But then the question is, not all of the data of these companies are Californians. Yeah. So also, how do you then, when the rest of the world starts knocking on, I want mm. my dividend as well, how do you sort that out? So I think there's really a big um, need for transparency and value of data, as well as what's actually useful, what's beneficial mm. to pushing our society forward and what do we want to use instead of just being used for marketing and reasons like that. Neil, how would you solve that issue of yeah. data ownership and yeah, rewarding so, people? So right now, the, the uh, privacy ecosystem is largely in favor of the governments and businesses and, and big business. But we need to move to a solution, and it can be a combination of uh, legal and regulatory framework, technology controls, as well as public awareness, where we move to a situation where data subjects, they have con control of how their data is contextually used, how it's contextually shared. If it's monetized, they can participate in that monetization, mm. but it needs to move away from being in favor of the big yeah. business and government. But, but that assumes you can find who owns the data. It's like it's the problem musicians have when somebody does a remix, and like, how do you know that it's your sample being used? Uh, Xu Bing, last question for you. Has this movie, you worked on this project for several years, has this movie changed the way you walk in public space? I started this, the making of this movie in 2013. And of course, it stopped for several years due to the lack of enough material. I resumed the, uh, I finished the movie in 2017. It's a um, future movie of 81 minutes in the process. Yes, I, I think I learned a lot about the relationship between surveillance and the people nowadays, and where does the energy of creation of fine arts come from? Where do our inspirations come from? It comes from our knowledge of fine art, or it comes from the re social reality. This is shed some light on my thoughts on this. My work, other works, I don't know if you are familiar or not, my fine art artwork, well, this is the film, the format is a film, but there is something in common between this work and my previous works. In my work, I want to, in a very careful way, to produce a reality, but this reality is something fake. Well, sorry, in Chinese English, it doesn't have this word. And uh, this is actually, this feature film is a mimic of a true feature film. It doesn't about a love story about two young people. Actually, I want to use this movie to show something different. In Chinese, we have a saying that if you want to attack the East, 
you need to lead your troop to the West. And if you are smart enough, if you can understand my language, you know I'm talking about something else, not this story. As Jennifer says, why you put some, or other people put some dramatic uh, 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 videos. Vector, I, I want to make it like a, 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 a blockbuster. And the traditional love story, you know, nowadays, in nowadays perspective, which is weird and uh, the fight, uh, the fragility, the details of tr of traditional love story, you know, is very small compared to nowadays um, the complexity. One more round of applause to our panelists, Xu Bing, Jennifer Lin Moron, and Neil Harper. Thank you very much. Thank you to all those who were watching us on the internet. Have a good afternoon. Xie xie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.